it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The Abandoned Home Ugh, Mystery. We all love it, one way or another. A nagging curiosity to find the truth drives people to do things they otherwise wouldn't. All reasonable senses are overthrown for some meaningless clarity. Well, mystery took everything from me. I just had a dream. It wasn't long. I returned to my waking nightmare. My eyes opened to streams of light peeking under the blinds. My familiar blue walls and old posters stared back at me, untouched ever since early childhood. My gaze drifted through the piles of disorganized college notebooks and papers from the recently ended semester toward my nightstand. The numbers on the digital clock read 9.45, July 8th, 2012. I stopped to process the astounding idea that it was already July, since summer felt like it had just begun, and I had wasted it. My stupor was cut short as the clock's obnoxious alarm faded in. A realization hit me. I was late for work again. My body kicked into gear and thoughtlessly rushed me out of the door and towards the bathroom. The hallway window shone like lasers into my pupils as I adjusted to the jarring change in lighting. Once I stepped into the washroom, my reflection revealed a man nearly unrecognizable to me. I rubbed my hands through sporadic facial whiskers up to the unkempt mane that I called a hairstyle. A concerning amount of dandruff rained down as I attempted to quickly tidy up well, what I could upon my head. From there I grabbed my toothbrush and inspected the disheveled bristles. At that moment, I made a promise in my head to finally start taking care of myself once I came home from work. Well, I had made that promise a countless number of times by now. Several abrupt thuds erupted from the bathroom door, where my mother's voice spoke. Derek, are you ever going to clean that disaster of a room you have there? <sighs> Whatever. This response was not uncommon in our family. I'll start on it after work today, okay? She was quick to strike back at me. Yeah, the same job you've been consistently late to. Look, you're better than this and you know it. Oh, she was right. Since the latest semester had begun, I'd become a shell of my former self. My grades were slipping and I barely passed my exams. Not without dropping the classes required to major in business. Something I'd wanted to pursue since I was a child. I had to transfer to a community college. My grades had become insufficient for Indiana State University. I had well, no idea where I was headed and made little effort to change. Likely today would be the last day I worked stocking the shelves of the rundown supply store. I'd be no more than some loser still living with his parents despite being spoon fed a multitude of opportunities. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'll be better. You should have been better six months ago, Derek. What you say means nothing. Mother's words drilled a pit within my soul. But I said nothing in response. After a piercing silence, she eventually strode off and towards the stairway. I made my way down to the first floor. My father was sitting on his usual chair in the living room. Oh, it's going to rain tonight. Get back soon today, he said peering up from the newspaper in his hands. The article he was reading was titled something about a kid lighting a house on fire. Yeah, all right, Dad. See ya. I spoke without much thought. And the car ride to work was arduous. I feared that the worst would happen. I feared that once I reached the store, my manager would be waiting just beyond the entrance to let me go after this last shift. Believe me when I said that the worst came... The final hours of my job were grueling. Most of my time consisted of me deciding what to say to mother once I imminently returned home. Nothing sounded right in my head. Didn't have enough time to process the fact that all my chances at a successful future had just finally dried up. And that thought was reserved for a later time. Once I'd left the supply store for good, 
All that was left between me and my grueling fate was the drive back home. Now, at this point, I hadn't fully grasped the idea that I'd lost my only chance to redeem myself. I'd have to admit to my parents that I had nothing to show for myself. I was truly a nobody that threw his life away without any apparent reason. I started sobbing like a needy toddler, the condensation in my eyes partially blocking my view of the ever-approaching road. I stopped caring. <laughs> so what if I died? Who'd even care? I sniffled wildly and wiped my tears. In the distance, I spotted an intersection up ahead and peered up at a stoplight as it clicked from green to yellow. Abruptly, I slowed down and stared toward the passing cars to my left. God, all those people with their lives all figured out. None of them knew that I even existed. Something I thought I saw made me rub my streaming eyes over and over again instinctively. In a black Nissan, there was a young man that closely resembled an old friend I'd once had. My vision finally cleared up and my suspicions had been confirmed. Yeah, the figure was my old pal, Johnny. His short blonde hair and oddly proportioned eyebrows couldn't be mistaken for any other person on earth. It had been since junior year of high school that last I saw him. We used to do what any adventurous, naive teenage boys would do, or oh, so I thought at the time. We'd wander in the woods late into the night and trespass into abandoned property. We pulled this off for quite a while until my father eventually caught on and made sure we never spoke to each other ever again. Ah, oh, you'd follow him into both of your deaths, he'd say. God, it had been such a long time since I'd seen him. At this point, I nearly erased him from my memory. Well, I felt that at any moment Johnny would meet my gaze. He appeared determined, as if he was going into an exam or something. Johnny moved his head to his side and began speaking to someone. Well, I hadn't even noticed the passenger in his car. It was a brown-haired woman with dyed blonde streaks. She was wearing abnormally large sunglasses that acted as a mask on her face, preventing me from being able to tell if I recognized her or not. I wondered if Johnny had found a girlfriend, although doubt began to settle in as I thought more about my past experiences with him. Now, Johnny was very abnormal, and from what I could tell, this woman may have been out of his league. Johnny looked at her as he spoke, but she seemed to ignore his gaze and periodically checked her phone. My mind wandered to thoughts of where Johnny lived now, and what occurred during my long period of absence from his life. I had no clue of what his choice of career could have been, since he never was good at anything truly substantial, well, as far as I knew. And then, a sudden sound boomed. The car behind me honked its horn, thrusting me back into reality as quickly as it escaped my mind. Johnny had already long driven past me. Without a moment of consideration, I turned right in order to follow behind him. I drove fifteen above the speed limit in an attempt to catch up with him. My critical thinking skills slowly came to me, and I wasn't sure why I decided to start heading in the opposite direction of my actual destination, simply to tail a loser kid that I hadn't seen in over half a decade. Well, it was another terrible decision that I needed to undo. I saw the trunk of his car once more and I decided to slow down. As time passed, I searched more and more closely for a place to turn around and head back towards the correct direction. The only issue was that the road I drove on became thin and unkempt. The potholes grew unavoidable. I was concerned that I'd end up driving somewhere I shouldn't be. Trees enveloped my surroundings and soon enough I was transported to another world, one with nothing else but silence and desolation. I was shocked at how quick the transition was. I couldn't have turned right any longer than five minutes ago. My fear slowly withered away and I grew calmer with the idea that I was escaping my predestination of massively and understandably furious parents. Oh, I could see them glaring at me and shaking their heads. I was a disappointment. Well, meeting Johnny might have been the thing I needed to push through the inevitable. My curiosity got the better of me. I wanted to know what he was up to, and thought that it wouldn't take too long. I never accounted for the possibility that Johnny was simply going for a drive, or 
Maybe it just wasn't a good time to speak to him. Oh, nothing else mattered at that moment of desperation. I knew not a bit of good would come whenever I did eventually return home. Barely a few more minutes had passed when Johnny's brake lights flashed on. He was stopping in the middle of nowhere. The only thing around his car was the tall, dry grasses beside the road. I slowed to a stop and put the car in park just as he opened the door and took a step onto the cracks that riddled the street. He was wearing jeans and a light orange shirt. I quickly leapt from my car seat and made myself apparent. Hey man, it's me, Derek, remember? For a second, Johnny's face held an expression of concern and confusion, but the memory of his old friend slowly formed the silly grin that I once knew and loved. Oh Christ, that was the last person I expected to see come out of that shit car. His voice was deeper and richer than I remembered it being. How is my old pal? I'm a shambles. You? Well, the exact opposite, matter of fact. The woman in the passenger seat was now glaring at me through the back window of the car, her identity hidden by those dim sunglasses of hers. Well, who you got in there, Johnny? I asked him, smiling. Johnny's grin faded into a serious stare. Realizing the sudden silence, Johnny attempted to lighten the mood. Oh, uh, sorry, he broke into a weak chuckle. <laughs> That's Lizzie. I thought it'd be fun to take her here for a date. It was clear that she was completely disinterested in whatever Johnny was planning. If I hadn't arrived, I wonder how the day would have played out for them. It doesn't matter much now. It would have ended the same way. Our conversation continued for a little while. Johnny seemed a little different, yet it was obvious that that was only a product of time. We caught up while his bored date sat in the car, no doubt trying to text her friends about the lousy day she was having. Both of us knew that well, we didn't care. Imagine if your best friend that you hadn't seen in over seven years randomly stopped behind you. We could have talked for hours. Hey, um, any reception out here? I might have to call my parents, I admitted. He reached into his pocket and took out a handheld phone. He flipped it open, stretching out his arms as if searching for a connection. Nope, nothing. Oh, sorry, man. Hey, how are you going to get in touch with them? Well, I scratched my back. It's okay. I shouldn't be out here for too long anyway. I began to chuckle then. I'll come up with an excuse sometime later. And we both laughed briefly. All right. Well, I think it's time we actually show this girl around. Johnny got up from leaning on the trunk of his car and knocked on the passenger window. What? I heard a faint voice behind the glass. Let's get started. Someone won't be out here for too much longer. Is it okay if I bring a friend along with us? Johnny's voice wavered in clear embarrassment by the end of that sentence. Fine, was all she spoke before reluctantly opening the door and getting out of the car, facing the long blades of grass blowing in the breeze. Based on the resent on her face, she knew she was going to hate this trip. Well, you know what? Maybe you could just drive me home instead. I mean, it's getting late anyway. I... Oh, come on, Lizzie. This won't take more than 30 minutes. I'll drive you back as soon as the clock hits eight, not a second later. Johnny's attempt to persuade her was pathetic, but she sighed and relented. Relieved, Johnny began walking forward towards the forest that surrounded us. All right, let's go. Oh, there's no cell service out here, Johnny. Please don't take too long, Lizzie moped, her hesitation audible. Oh, it won't, it won't, Johnny assured her. You'll love it, I promise you. He disappeared into the grass, leaving me and Lizzie behind. I was the next to go, and she unenthusiastically trailed behind me. What are we even doing here, Johnny? I finally thought to ask. It's right over here. You'll see. Just come on. His voice softly reverberated off the trees as we methodically trudged through into the forest, Johnny the only one with the slightest idea of what was ahead of us. I listened to the chirps of the crickets and the subtle sway of the leaves. 
A deep voice cut through the peaceful ambience. Here we are. Johnny planted his feet on the overgrown turf and unveiled something that seemed out of place. Welcome home, guys. Looking back at us, the smirk on his face had returned. He planted his shoulder on the object. It was a disheveled mailbox, and the paint had long since peeled off, in its place a trail of vines and blisters connected by planks of wood. Lizzie stood still, unimpressed by the whole ordeal. I, on the other hand, felt a giddy excitement resurface that I hadn't felt in years. No freaking way, man. You found a house? His smile grew wider. Oh, not just any old house. Oh, no. This one's special. Johnny turned and separated the tall grasses with his arms. A rustic home was lying just on the other side. Both Lizzie and I gasped simultaneously. It looked as though it had been untouched by man for several decades. The landscaping was overgrown and messy. Blinds blocked every one of the windows, swaying slowly. The wood on the doorstep was broken up by the stems of hundreds of weeds. A layer of black and brown muck covered the message on the doormat. The door itself had been left wide open, but a dark cloak muddled whatever was inside. The three of us were left standing still, gawking at this extraordinary discovery before our eyes. How the hell? Lizzie spoke under her breath. She took the sunglasses off her face, revealing bright green eyes that shimmered in the sunlight. They were glued onto the house. Johnny lowered his arms and pushed through the final stretch of tall grass to the stoop of the abandoned home. We followed suit shortly after, invigorated by a newfound sense of wonder and curiosity. The floorboards of the porch creaked and crackled under the sudden weight of Johnny. It was clearly the first time someone had stepped foot in this place for many years. As I came closer, I was able to discern the full extent of decay that had eaten away at the exterior of the home. The lowering sun cast long, slender shadows, signaling that the remaining daylight was expiring. We had to see what was inside before nightfall. Johnny grabbed at his sides, taking a couple of flashlights out of his jean pockets. Oh, only got two. You'll have to share with Derek, Lizzie, he reasoned. Tough luck. I'm not sharing anything, Lizzie fired back, now visibly excited to find out what lay beyond the black abyss beside the open front door. Oh, come on now. No, I'll be fine. Just don't roam too far ahead of me. I don't want to get lost in there with no light. I interrupted Johnny, not wanting to waste any more time arguing. I wasn't even supposed to be there with them anyways. He handed Lizzie a flashlight and stepped into the entrance. With a click, Johnny illuminated a white beam of light into his surroundings. Dust whisked around faded wallpaper and old paintings. The torch waved around, revealing the old-fashioned furniture and appliances of the first-floor living room and kitchen. The interior of the home was a time capsule of yesteryear. A second light met the first and then faced the opposite direction as Lizzie broke away from Johnny. Letting her be, I trailed behind my old friend and made conversation for a little while. I noticed that he couldn't remember some of our old escapades, at the time, we'd broken into a barn house, only to find a dozen maggot-riddled pigs dead in their pen. They were beside the body of the old farmer, only his head peeking out of a body of hay. It was one of the last times we'd hung out before my dad stepped in. So, um, how'd you find this place? I asked, while making an effort to keep up with him. Well... A week or so ago, I was winding down after a long night of unsuccessfully lurking around the area for something to break into. I was about to accept my defeat and return home when I stumbled into this beauty. Johnny stuttered, speaking slower than he had before. I couldn't have wasted such a discovery by myself. I had to bring someone with me. Johnny continued recounting how the rest had played out. I was simply a last-minute surprise after a week of him searching for someone to go with him. Well, hey, uh, three's better than two, he said. We explored the first floor of the home, 
waiting in an adolescent-like excitement to see something shocking or terrifying. Eventually, I met up with Lizzie and began a conversation. She was in her early 20s and fresh out of college. It was a summer vacation and she was spending it with her grandparents. She spoke as if it was the worst thing that could have happened to her, and despite her attempts to get out of it, her parents didn't give her any other option. Bored out of her mind, Lizzie had spent the days at her grandparents swiping on dating apps without getting any matches. And that all changed the day before when Johnny's face appeared on her phone screen. She told me that his Tinder profile was unflattering, but between wasting yet another day doing nothing and going out with him, Lizzie chose the latter without so much as a second thought. She suddenly yelped. Hey, what happened? I asked in concern. And she then pointed the light at what had spooked her. It was a single spider. She muttered under her breath. God, I hate those things. The eight-legged creature was no larger than a quarter dollar. It stood at the back into a tiny crevice in the ground. After examining the first floor, we decided to go down into the basement. The door to the staircase was connected to the living room, and an ominous odour caused us to lock eyes. Whoa, it smells like someone died. Johnny remarked with a scrunched nose, strangely captivated that we might finally stumble into something freaky. If something actually died down there, don't we have to call the cops or something? She wondered, cringing at the stench that only seemed to worsen each second the door was open. Hell no, I answered adamantly. If we see some shit like that, we get the hell out of here. Lizzie nodded slightly. Well, we ready? I'm ready if you guys are, Johnny said, holding his hands to his waist. Lizzie was reluctant, but curiosity had already consumed her. We were far past the point of no return. So the three of us headed down the steps, finding an unfinished basement with rugged nails and old wires tangling the incomplete wooden frame. And the smell worsened. Lizzie and Johnny turned off their flashlights. Enough natural light filled the room to see everything clearly, yet it was dimmer than when we'd initially entered the house. There wasn't much down there, except for some storage boxes and hanging light fixtures. A single lighter lay isolated in a corner. It was cramped, the three of us barely fitting within the space without being uncomfortably close. There was a screen door that led outside to a small concrete landing, leaves and dirt scraping the long, unclean glass. The sunset was hard to see past an abundance of trees of the surrounding forest. Clouds had started to form in the sky. It was going to rain soon. Johnny stood awkwardly, and then his demeanor changed and he broke the silence. Ah, there's nothing in here, man. We don't even have enough time to search the boxes. We'll uh, come back later. No one argued against him, but both Lizzie and I knew that we wouldn't be coming back. We hiked up the steps and shut the door behind us. Nothing else seemed out of the ordinary as we continued searching. The three of us were let down due to how normal the house had appeared. And Johnny took it the hardest, having waited an entire week to search what turned out to be spectacularly uncaptivating. Even when moving upstairs, the beds of each room were neatly made up and everything seemed moderately clean. If it wasn't for the massive accumulation of dust and the wide open front door, we would have thought that somebody still lived there. I became concerned that we'd find the owner rotting in one of the bedrooms. Alas, nobody, except us three, were in the home. Oh, was that it? Johnny murmured his disappointment after exploring the last bathroom in the house and, yet again, finding nothing out of the ordinary. His voice was slightly slurred, but barely noticeable. All right, it's getting dark out, guys. Let's head back, Lizzie said just as unsatisfied with the findings as Johnny. We turned back and made our way down the screeching steps. Taking one last look, Johnny stopped for a moment and waved his flashlight around the living room and kitchen in defeat. A wormy insect wriggled around the floor, but I paid no attention. It was time to go home. I walked past Johnny and stepped through the front entrance. The moonlight was softly peeking through the tall forest trees, creating a dim glow in the darkness. It started to drizzle, tiny raindrops landing on my head and shoulders. Lizzie paced in front of me, quickly trekking through the tall grass. 
We brushed through and found ourselves back beside the parked cars. And at that moment, I realized that Johnny wasn't following behind us. Hey, uh, let's go! I turned and yelled, just loud enough for him to hear. There was no response, except for my own words echoing back at me. Afterwards, the peaceful ambience of the night was the only sound I could hear. Johnny, come on! I tried once more. But nothing. I shifted my gaze to Lizzie, who glared at the woods impatiently. What could he possibly be doing? She scoffed. Frustrated, I turned back and brushed through the tall grasses, stopping for a moment to pull a stray strand off my work shirt. Then I continued moving until the home met my eyes once again. The dark masked many of the house's deteriorating features. Any random passerby may have believed it was recently redone. The illusion piqued my interest, but only for a moment. Remembering the reason I'd turned back, I watched the front door to see if Johnny was still there. From where I was standing, I couldn't see anything inside the home. I started to feel a slow fury build because Johnny was still acting like he'd find something worth all the time we'd wasted exploring it. He just wouldn't give this up, would he? I was reminded of just how much trouble I was in. If they hadn't already, my parents would surely disown the disappointment I'd become if I didn't get back right now. Reality washed over me in that moment. I realized how truly stupid my decision to follow Johnny was. The front door held before it a black hole that I began to reconsider entering. I stepped back and thought it through. Johnny had to be playing a terrible joke on me. I should just turn around and drive home. Oh, be that way, man. I'm leaving with or without you. My voice was silently filled with rage. I broke out into a jog back to my car, but was cut short by a dreadful scream. It had to have been Johnny. The sudden sound stole my focus, leading me to snag my ankle on a sudden incline. The shock knocked me off balance, and I tripped into the dirt with my head. Stars filled my vision, and a sharp pain shot up and down my body. The night was silent. Groaning, I forced myself to stand back up, a pulsing sting swirling around my skull. At that second, I thought the scream felt too genuine and horrified to have been manufactured by him. The very memory of the sound hurts to imagine. I scrambled to see what had happened. The front door was unmoved, welcoming me back inside. Now I had to find Johnny. Lizzie rushed behind me in a panic. What the hell was that? Her body shook as she gasped for air. I said nothing, but the shock on my face seemed an adequate enough response for her. I felt a slim stream of blood run down my forehead. I rubbed it with my hand, examining the injury. What happened to you? Are you okay? Johnny then let out a sound that didn't feel human. It was silent, and then he pleaded. Help! Lizzie's face dropped further as she fearfully looked at the front door and back at me. Johnny, we're coming! She exhaled and dashed towards the front porch. I raced behind her and jumped up the front steps. Is that really a good idea? I whispered to her while wiping my forehead and examining the blood. She abruptly stopped before entering the entrance of the home and looked back at me indecisively. A few seconds passed, and without exchanging another word, she made her decision. Lizzie stepped into the home once again, disappearing for a moment before I did the same. Her flashlight clicked on, and an orb of light frantically danced around the familiar settings in her shaking hand. Johnny was nowhere to be seen. Pitch black darkness closed in on us as we moved deeper into the home. I could hear myself calling out for Johnny but my mind was in a completely different place. My parents' rigid faces were all that I could see, silently judging me for all my poor decisions. But the worst one I'd made by far was stepping back inside of that home. We heard the slam of a door from a direction that neither of us could confidently discern. I should have turned back. I should have left without a word, car keys in hand. I contemplated it the entire time, but why would I leave Lizzie on her own? I knew she wouldn't budge if I notioned for her to leave with me. 
She wanted to know what had happened to my old friend, and admittedly, so did I. Uh, there was no going back. I moved alongside Lizzie, but something was wrong. There was something with us. I felt so vulnerable without a flashlight of my own to protect myself from whatever lay dormant in the black clouds that filled my vision, patiently waiting for the moment I lowered my guard. Lizzie's light began to wheeze, and suddenly it was gone. The yelling for Johnny ceased at once. I was alone. My breathing grew heavy. God, I was always afraid of the dark. I always knew the fear was irrational, but that there was nothing that could possibly be hiding beyond my sight to grab me when I wasn't looking yet. Well, it never went away. It hid well during my outings with Johnny in high school, but it was always nagging at me. The difference then is that I had my own flashlight, my own raft of safe and precious light that protected me from enveloping darkness. A noise muddled my thoughts, then another. It was the click of a flashlight. Yet I didn't have enough time to process relief before Johnny's face was revealed to me, inches away from my own. There you are, buddy. Where'd you go? He spoke in a whisper. I stuttered and then collected myself. This was Johnny and that was his voice. It must have been a prank this entire time. Lizzie had to have been on it as well. That had to be the explanation. Well, I whispered back at him. You got me good, Johnny. Now, let's get out of here, man. I tried to act cool, hide the terror riddling my voice. I had no idea why we were being so quiet. Not even thirty minutes ago, we saw for ourselves that nobody lived here. The torch was pointed at his chin, oversaturating his face with light. It hid most of his features, except for his eyes, nose, mouth, and the curly hair on his forehead. The light failed to illuminate the space around us. Why are you leaving so soon? He quietly spoke, not a twinge of laughter in his voice, as if what he was saying wasn't completely nonsensical and detached from the screaming of minutes ago. Then he continued. You have to go to work tomorrow. I stared at his face, slowly approaching mine despite me clearly backing away from him. About an hour ago, I told him that I'd been fired from my job. This made no sense to me. If he was cracking another weak joke, why wasn't he breaking out into laughter? More importantly, he hadn't even made an attempt to acknowledge the prank he'd just pulled. It was unlike Johnny, and I couldn't make any sense of it. Hey man, fuck you. I realized that I'd unconsciously raised my voice. He processed my statement for a moment, read my body language, then broke out into an unnatural chuckle. It was sudden and loud. You've always been hysterical, buddy. He managed to choke out, and his laugh quickly dispersed. Then, in a flash, Johnny's left eye drooped down and straightened itself. It happened so fast that I wasn't completely sure that I didn't just imagine it. There was an uneasy silence, and then he opened his mouth to talk. Hey. The voice was hoarse and raspy. He cleared his throat and tried again. Hey, uh, follow me. It was Johnny again. I didn't move. Did you hear? He cracked again. Hear what I said, buddy? Johnny's voice was lower than before. His tongue slipped out of his mouth. I was petrified. There was clearly something wrong. I had a terrible sensation in my stomach that screamed for me to leave. Adrenaline started to pump through my veins. I had to get out of there right then. Don't make me force you, Johnny growled in a voice I could no longer recognize. He briefly lowered the light, allowing me to discern more of his features. His skin sagged and his eyes looked dead. There was a mound growing in his face as if a sand dune sharply rose from a flat desert. It scurried across his face and down his chin. Well, I wasn't risking another second. I turned around and ran. I had no idea where I was going, 
whatever Johnny had become clicked off the flashlight, and I could hear wet, shuffling footsteps approaching my direction. Don't you run from me. Something snagged my knee. I toppled over and used my hands to break my fall. Quickly, I strained my teeth and pushed myself back on my feet. The unquenchable hunger in Johnny's grunts drew near. It was the most horrific noise I'd ever heard up until that point. I was sure I'd soon be dead, and yet I pushed through the inconceivable pain in my knees and searched for somewhere to go, anywhere. I had no such luck. The pattering steps stopped. It was quiet once again, and I could hear the breeze outside. Despite this, the thumping in my chest only sped up. This was the last moment of peace I would have before I died. Hopefully it would be painless. That was all I could ask for. My legs were ready to give out. I had to slow down. Now at a walking pace, I heaved in agonizing pain and began to sob. I couldn't hear his footsteps. I had no idea where he was. The sheer terror overwhelmed me and I broke down in a panic. This was the end. I was rocking back and forth on the floor, whimpering uncontrollably. The knowledge that you were about to die was mind-boggling. It filled my soul with staggering dread. I couldn't run for my life. I couldn't even move. I couldn't even breathe. Something wet dripped onto my neck. Another click of the flashlight then the fumble of it falling down onto the floor. It rolled beside my shivering leg and then stopped. Another drip of fluid landed on my upper back. I opened my eyes. The ray of white light made me adjust my vision. It was pointed at the front door directly in front of me. I was so close to the outside world. Maybe I should make a move for it. Again, a drip on my back. I craned my neck to the ceiling. There was something breathing. I clasped the flashlight with hands drenched with sweat and pointed it upwards. I had to know what was up there. The light flickered rapidly and died, yet I had just enough time to see a pair of black, bloodshot eyes glaring deep through me. Below it was something unexplainable. An endless black tongue slithered unnervingly across its face, gushing with drooling saliva. I saw the silhouette of Johnny's body, stretched unfathomably from what I recognized, but it was still him. My legs propelled me toward where I saw the front door. My arms searched for the doorknob that, when twisted, would lead me to my salvation. I now felt a cold nothingness, functioning only by the primal instinct to survive. My fingers desperately scraped the walls, but to no avail. I could feel a wave of tears reach my eyes once more. A moist slap hit the floor directly behind me. It was too late. An indescribable roar filled the room. The monster stomped rapidly towards me and I made a break for my right. It grasped my arm, the sudden change of direction forcing my body into whiplash. I was going nowhere. Its skin was rubbery and cold. The fingers stretched and throbbed as if there were thousands of insects thriving within it. Time slowed. I made pitiful attempts to stand up, to escape my fate. Yet its grip only got stronger with every effort. I screamed and cried as the monster pinned me down. Both of its arms held me in place on the floor, moaning in sick pleasure. Seeping saliva drenched my shirt and quickly streamed down my legs. Its hellish tongue stretched and heaved, wrapping itself around my neck. I knew what was to come. My memories flashed before my eyes. My childhood, the times with Johnny, the many people that had come and gone in high school, the family members that had died, my mum, my dad. It was time to say goodbye. I opened my mouth and chomped my teeth shut with all the strength I had on whatever was choking me to death. It throbbed and thrashed violently in response. The grip on me loosened, but my teeth only sank further into it. 
It had large, round taste buds coated in thick and disgusting saliva. His arms moved quickly, rushing to pull me off and end the excruciating pain that I was inflicting upon it. I felt arms grab my legs and tear me away. It screeched and yelped after I landed harshly on the wood flooring. The monster convulsed and flailed around in the darkness, blindly stomping around the entrance of the home. I lurched and spat in hysteria. The beast briefly stopped, then skittered off further into the home. I shuddered, cold and petrified on the ground. I began to relax once the sound of the monster's cries slowly faded away. The noise of rain hitting the windows took its place, getting heavier by the second. It was once again peaceful. I felt around my body to make sure to myself that I was still alive. I realized that I couldn't even see my own arms in front of me. I needed to find that flashlight. There was a distant creak of floorboards directly above my head. I panicked, crawling around the immediate area for that light. My clothes were drenched, but I fought back against my disgust. Several seconds passed without a trace. I wondered if I was anywhere near where I'd broken down just minutes ago. My emotions had become incomprehensible, muted despite what had just happened. I still felt nothing. Nothing but an unrelenting dread. My left hand snagged something out of the blue. I fumbled it around, trying to get a sense of what it was. It was a leech. I crushed it in my palm, blood and other fluids splattering my fingers. The intensifying downpour outside was able to mask any unintentional sounds that I was making while moving around. There was more commotion upstairs. It sounded like someone frantically opening drawers and moving furniture. I was searching for something. The floor above me screamed in response to its stumbling, as if it was ready to give out. I felt an object on the ground. In my palms, it was slim and smoothly rounded. I found a rubber button and pushed it down. The light flickered, then died. I shook the flashlight and tried again. The white beam shot out toward the vintage wallpaper and living room furniture that it was pointed towards. With a wheeze, it flickered rapidly and went out again. The staircase croaked. Johnny was coming back downstairs. Shaking, I got to my feet once more, hitting and shaking the flashlight. The pain all over my body had dissipated by now. I moved quickly and as silently as I could, masked by the storm brewing outside. I tried the door once more, realizing that it was without any doorknob. I couldn't manage to force it open, so I needed to hide. I had no idea where or for how long. The pulse in my chest rapidly increased with each step that Johnny descended. I clicked the light on and off rapidly, leaving just enough illumination for me to see where I was going. I scanned the living room for any trace of Lizzie without finding anything. Something wailed, the sound echoing throughout the house. Hey man. Johnny's voice was low, stretching out each word unnaturally long. You hurt me. It began a distorted whimper, as if replicating the sound of a human's cries. Why did you hurt me? I could discern pattering steps on the walls. It sobbed between words. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Why can't I find you? I crawled under the coffee table. The flashlight wouldn't turn on now. Wouldn't give no matter how many times I clicked the button. The weeping was cut off for a moment, and a whisper took its place. Johnny was changing tactics. Mm, I can see you. He skidded up onto the ceiling, and then Johnny repeated himself. I can see you. The darkness was shattered by lightning. Johnny was directly above me. Below him, I saw a door. It was the one to the basement. The light escaped the home once more. In the pitch black, I realized exactly what I needed to do. The screen door downstairs. I could make my escape. The monster huffed. 
It hadn't found me yet, and thunder filled the home once more. I moved away from the coffee table, darting towards where I'd glimpsed the basement door. The steps were inaudible on the living room carpet. I got to the wall, reaching around until my hand felt the door. Methodically, I pushed down on the door hinge and pulled it open, trying to make as little sound as possible. Candles were lit downstairs. Something that I saw caused me to lock up. There were so many spiders, hundreds of them scattering up the walls and round the stairs. On top of the spiders were the endless mass of maggots squirming and thriving in an endless pulse. They disappeared into something and popped out of different places. They came in slender and came out fat and full. It was Lizzie's corpse. I turned, feeling something arise from my stomach and up my throat. Lightning struck, thunder roared. I puked on the living room floor, and in response the monster ceased. Its breathing became audible. The sound was raspy, a deep wheeze following every exhale. Then it dropped to the floor, and a sudden flash of lightning filled the room, revealing the monster's tongue warping and stretching as it lurched, slender black arms toward my direction. One of those arms held an axe. The home was pitch black again. The candlelight flickered over the squirming maggots. I wiped my face as the roar of thunder struck my ears, and I took a step into the mass. I both heard and felt the squelch of crushed insects and felt layers of desperate movement below my foot. Then I took another step around the remains, and I stepped down further. I felt a maggot enter the heel of my shoe, but there was no time to stop. The monster had reached the doorway. It took a swing at me, the axe connecting and slicing my back open. My body went limp and I stumbled down the rest of the stairs, hitting my head on the wall and falling unconscious. I landed ungracefully on the cement floor, and all I could see were stars, as if I'd drifted off into space. Insects enveloped my arms and legs. Oh, the tingling was light, but it was everywhere. They wriggled around my torso and towards my neck. The beast took the first step into the basement with me. I couldn't open my eyes. The pain was hazy, but so was everything else. I gave no resistance to what was happening this time. Maggots running up and down my face, preparing to burrow deep into my skin. My index finger twitched. Then the ring finger. I could move my thumb again. I could sense the pool of blood on the palms of my hands. I lifted my arm, feeling the maggots entering my flesh. My eyelids drifted open, the beam of the torch angled directly into the staircase. My fingers wiped every insect they could off of my face and arms. I could see Johnny's legs now. They were next to Lizzie's, both standing on the top step. Oh, she was alive. They descended simultaneously, their features entering into the light. Lizzie had become unrecognizable. Her limbs thrived and moved unnaturally. Creatures nested themselves inside of their bodies. Johnny's tongue had thin, pulsating veins spiraling around itself. The torch flickered again, slightly at first, then more and more. Before it died, I could see their eyes. It was like when I saw them in the car. They were beside each other, Seemingly determined, but this time it wasn't to explore an abandoned home. No, they'd already done that. Now they were here to eat me alive. I saw my mother and father in their place. Even if I did return home, what was left for me? Parents that would kick me out. A life that I'd ruin myself because of my own stupidity. My death wouldn't even matter to anyone. What friends did I have? Johnny... A spider crawled up his left eye, and then the vision of my parents was gone, and I was at peace with what was about to happen. They both reached the bottom step. The light went out completely. Bring him to me. A muffled voice arose from the darkness. 
Two pairs of arms dragged me across the floor. I couldn't tell what was happening. By now, I wasn't strong enough to care. I heard boxes being moved aside. The downpour of rain had become intense. A match was lit, and then a candle began flickering. A red glow began to rise. Johnny and Lizzie's remains turned me around so I could see something. Another candle sprang to life. The lighter was dropped in the corner of the room. I eyed it, but... Not a thought reached my mind. My strength was gone. I was going to die. Why even try? What would I even be able to do with a lighter? My fixation was broken. There were dozens of flattened, decomposing bodies spread out against the wall, previously hidden by the rows of stacked boxes. There was a rustic table, and on that table was a silver platter, one well chiselled with detailed and beautiful designs that looked spectacular. On top of that platter was a decapitated head. It was the most horrific thing I'd ever seen. Its eyes bulged out of its skull, dead and empty. I could see the black stump in its neck where its head had disconnected from its body. Its hair was wiry and sparse. Its skin was decaying and turning black. His mouth opened, revealing rotten molars that lied inside of a crooked jaw. Turn me upright, it whispered and spat, flapping its mouth wildly. The voice was indiscernible, yet predatory. The voice of the monster under your bed, the voice of the tall figure tapping at your window deep into the night. Lizzie rushed to pick up the head. She gently lifted it off the plate and then placed it back down straight up. It sniffled, then blinked several times. It took a long, deep breath. Perfect. It clicked its tongue, straining the words out of its mouth. The head suddenly coughed, and a maggot climbed out of its nose and slithered up its skull. Cut off the boy's head. I want his body as my own. It closed its eyes as it spoke, and then slowly reopened them. Johnny raised his axe and stretched his shoulders. I've been searching for someone with your body for decades. The head wheezed and choked. All of these lifeless husks are from children just like you and Johnny, trespassing into my home too. To... It paused. The head took a moment and thoroughly glanced at the rotting corpses lining the wall. Oh, nobody suited my taste like you have, boy. A spark of adrenaline shot through my veins. I tried moving my arms around. I took a deep breath and made an effort to get to my feet, but the slicing pain in my back shot up and overpowered my will. <sighs> There's nowhere to go, boy. It made a pitiful cackle, cut short by a fit of coughing. Oh, sorry I couldn't meet with you earlier. I wasn't quite prepared for your arrival continued to cackle under its breath. I looked up at its eyes, now locked onto me. They were evil, yet starving. Your friend Johnny, I killed him. I used his body to bring me Lizzie. You were simply a pleasant surprise. I was shocked. The friend I saw beside Lizzie just hours ago was nothing more than a lifeless carcass following the will of a decapitated head. Johnny shuffled toward me while Lizzie stood in the corner of the room. The head started to salivate, streams of spit running down its chin. Johnny lazily grabbed at the axe, leaning against the wall, and took another step in my direction. My last resort was to fight back. I kicked at Johnny's shins, a cry escaping my lips. A storm of insects rushed out of his leg. Lizzie clumsily stepped over the corpses and got a hold of my arm. With a force, she lifted me off the ground and onto my feet. For the first time, the head saw the gash across my back. His perfect vessel was now imperfect. Ah, oh, insolence, I heard it growl. He is useless, useless. I peered down at the ground in a haze. There was so much blood, my blood. I didn't have much time left. Johnny backed down and faced the head. 
I saw his eyebrows arch in a deep rage. <clears throat> Look, he choked, at what you've done. The words escaped its mouth with force, yet they weren't any louder than a whisper. The head groaned, gritting its rotten teeth while spiders skittered around its black gums. Johnny croaked in pain and fumbled backwards, his arms swinging with him. In an instant, maggots rained out of Johnny's body and piled up onto the concrete flooring. He became lifeless, indistinguishable from the other hollow corpses surrounding him against the wall. His tongue had finally been eradicated from this earth, creatures pouring out of its long, black surface. Johnny looked completely deflated. Lizzie kept still, continuing to hold my arms so they were standing up. Pity, pity boy, your body would have been so very useful to me. It sputtered, wheezing and closing its eyes before continuing. Now, feed me the scoundrel. Lizzie dropped me at once. I flopped to the ground like a rag doll, my face contorted in roaring pain. She scooped a pile of the maggots that had just inherited Johnny, and Lizzie began to move, her eyes meeting the heads until she was directly facing it. She reached over and poured the handful into its mouth. My mind suddenly became clear. This was my chance. The lighter. I closed my eyes, breathed in, and started crawling for the corner of the room. I had no idea what I was even doing. I had even less of a clue of what to do with a lighter. I heaved, but forced myself to stay quiet. The only reason I was still alive was because Lizzie was still occupied with her head, the slimy pops and gushing of chewing permeating my ears. I was making slow progress, sweat dripping down my brow and building up in the palms of my hands. I tried to forget the insufferable pain in my back, yet it constantly tested every effort I made. A tear dripped down my chin. I sniffled, pushing forward at something that wouldn't possibly be able to save my life. Oh, I could burn the whole house, but well, I'd be trapped inside of it. There was no escaping this, yet the thought of putting an end to that head drove me forward. I heard it spit. Sob him. I want you to stop him. And it licked the maggot remains around its mouth. I didn't hear a single footstep. By now I was only an arm's length away from the lighter. I swung my arms toward it. And I missed it twice. But I needed to get closer. My body made one final effort to push itself forward. Yet it was too late. A storm of insects slithered around my arms and up my body, and within seconds they crawled up my face and entered my ears and nostrils. Some poked towards my intestines, and I screamed in sheer terror until I couldn't breathe any more. I couldn't hear anything as my ears plugged with worms and maggots. I felt antennas push up against my lips, forcing my mouth open. I was being suffocated. They covered my eyes and created a cocoon around my entire body. But despite this, the lighter remained in the palms of my hands. I blindly fumbled with the small thing through layers of insects, clumsily popping it open. And by now I could feel them making their way down my throat. My mind was starting to fade once more. This was the last chance I had. I flicked the light, yet felt nothing. I tried over and over and over again to no avail. Insects slid up my nose and towards my brain. They began to nest inside my body, eating away at my innards. Then I felt the fizz of a single spark, then a flicker. And flames shot up around me. Hundreds of insects withered and died in a mere instant. The fire spread up and down, and the creatures fled for survival. Beyond the noise of desperate squirming, there was muffled agony. I felt something run up my throat and nose. My eyes opened. Uh, kill the fire, everyone. The head was struggling to speak. Mounds and mounds of creatures rushed to fill the husks. They began to animate and inflate. Some lifted their heads, breathing raggedly and attempting to stand. Oh, there were dozens all rising from their place on the ground. They were rotting. I grabbed the lighter and chucked it towards them. A teenage boy erupted into fire, 
wickering flames covering the body that was once his. The others stumbled, letting out guttural screams as if they were all burning simultaneously. It spread quickly, and within moments I was surrounded by flames. Hundreds of insects shriveled up. I lurched and spat worms and cockroaches, only adding to the fire. The fire that I was soon engulfed in as well. Lizzie keeled over and her skin separated. Two or three husks tumbled over at a time. Dead leeches and worms spilled out of them until they were once again deflated and empty. I desperately tried to kill the flames on my arms and legs as I forced myself to stand. My ears started to clear. The head was roaring in a low, demented voice. It was clearly suffering. The fire spread to the wooden pillars that held the unfinished basement in place. I stood amidst the erupting flames that consumed my tattered clothes and flesh. It spread to my scar, to where fierce waves of fresh pain incapacitated me once more. I fell to my knees, unable to handle all of this pain at once. I was screaming, my mind was ringing and pulsating in horror, and the suffering of a slow death. I stumbled forward with my hands and knees in the direction of the screen door on the other side of the room. I wasn't going to make it. The head's demented eyes sunk into its skull as it yelled. Its forehead caved in on itself shortly before it melted into a paste of thick, grey fluid. Its pain had finally ceased, but mine only got worse. The inferno rapidly picked up speed, eating its way at my sides. I wasn't farther than three meters away from the screen door to my salvation. With distorted vision, I could see raindrops hitting the glass. I realized then that there was no sound except for the constant ringing. I could feel it permeating around my skull, screeching internally for escape. My legs became unresponsive, nothing but searing red flesh connected to my waist. The flames made their way up towards my neck. I was being slowly and mercilessly eaten away into nothingness. I was now an arm's length away from the screen door. I watched my hands flailing, trying to reach for it, grasping at the white handle that guarded the paradise beyond. The flames began feasting on my upper arms now. There wasn't any more time. I struggled and then got a hold of the door. Gritting my teeth, I exerted the last of whatever energy I had remaining to unleash the gates of heaven. The door squeaked, gliding open and separating decade-old spider webs. A raindrop landed on my nose, splashing into my eyes, rinsing some of the blood from around my mouth. It was the touch of a higher power on my face, hundreds of fingers grazing me from head to toe. I was no longer engulfed in fire. I was no longer in purgatory. The ringing faded. Lying on the concrete landing outside of the burning abandoned home, I accepted death with open arms. The beeping of medical equipment trickled through my consciousness. I opened my eyes. I was in a hospital bed. All dazed, I examined my immediate surroundings. There were two white sheets by my sides, separating me from the other patients. Everything in the room was white, from the floors, to the walls, to the lights. I was in a white tomb. My legs were gone, replaced by medical bandages that wrapped around me. Fire had eaten into my upper body, but not to the same extent. The forest around the abandoned home had caught fire. Firemen arrived, discovering me close to the source of the forest fire, and paramedics then soon followed. I had several surgeries. The ones I had first were to save my life. The next was to remove the remains of my legs. Some others were to relocate skin in order to conceal the burns on my arms and surrounding my upper body. I had several to restitch the axe scar on my back. I couldn't have been in the hospital for any less than six months. I had to wear prosthetic legs for the rest of my life. But... Well, I couldn't care less. I had a new start, a new chance to live. Well, that enthusiasm didn't last. Before long, years passed. I got my life back on track and eventually made it back into university. My parents couldn't have been more proud of me. Well, they moved on from the abandoned home, 
The world moved on. Nobody cares about what happened anymore. <laughs> Why should they? Johnny and Lizzie were forgotten. Johnny's parents never went to his funeral. Lizzie's mother committed suicide. Her grandmother passed away a while ago now from natural causes. I don't get much out of life anymore. Some days I can't get myself out of bed. For me, it's too hard to find a reason to keep going. Whatever joy I had left burned up in that house. Now every day is starting to blend into one another. I go to work, come home, climb into my bed. I used to cry myself to sleep, but now I can't feel much of anything anymore. Sometimes, late into the night, I can see that head. It floats lifelessly at the end of the hallway with its horrible eyes. Its mouth is always open, seemingly shocked at how worthless I'd become. I wish it was real, that it would finish what it had started. I want to feel the leeches and maggots and spiders consume me until I am a corpse. I want to feel what it's like to slowly die again and finally go through with it this time. Maybe my mother will grieve for a while, but eventually she'll be gone and forgotten like all the rest of us. Oh, my father is deep into dementia. doesn't even recognize me anymore. His mind is gone. Well, to me, he died years ago. I still visit my mother on occasion. She's a sad old woman, the loss of her husband changing her for the worst. She tells me that the only thing she still looks forward to is the times that I come to see her. Whenever I do, I always make an effort to drive past the house. In the far reaches of my mind, I imagine that when I pass by, it'll stand like it did before that day, as if that day had never happened. In reality, the home may as well have never existed in the first place. A new development was built around that house. Sidewalks replaced the overgrown grass. The world left the abandoned home behind. I see people living their lives, oblivious to the horror I'd experienced there. I hate them all. I want them to feel what I went through. But the anger is brief. By now I can't even remember exactly where the house once was. That realisation still makes me tear up. I don't know why. Occasionally I'll dream of the ambience of that night. Standing next to Lizzie. We're near the park cars, waiting for Johnny to leave the abandoned home. Her arms are crossed. I tell her that I wish I'd died in that home with Johnny and her, but she never responds. The last night, though, she shifted her gaze to me. She breathed in slowly. Move on. And then I woke up. It wasn't a long dream. No, the waking nightmare awaiting me is far longer. Well, I haven't done something that creepy and totally messed up in quite a while, and it's a bit of a refreshing change, to be honest. Very, very grim, uh... Totally lacking hope at the end, but I don't know. Sometimes you need um, the horror to be real and to, like, there'd be no way out in the end. Well, quite exhausting, that one, so... Oh, yes, that's it for Wednesday evening. Back again tomorrow with the next episode of the podcast. Almost been doing that a year. I can't believe how fast that year's gone. Well, there you go. Time flies when you're having fun. And, of course, I'll be back again here on Friday evening. But until the next time, very, very sweet dreams, my dear friends, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.